Hi everyone, thank you for attending today's webinar, Tailoring Product Pages for SEO and Shopping Feed Success. Uh, we're going to be talking about steps you should be taking in order to make sure that each one of your product pages is the best it can be for optimal exposure in both paid and organic search results. Uh, we're going to have a live Q&A at the end of the webinar, so as you start thinking of questions to ask us, you can go ahead and type them into GoToMeeting and we can answer them at the end of the presentation. Uh, it looks like some of you are already using that chat function. We got a couple people saying hi, so uh, that's great, keep it coming. And also we'll be sending you webinar participants this entire slide deck after the webinar ends, so don't worry about taking notes right now. Uh, the links that you see on these slides aren't gonna be clickable while you're watching, but again, you'll be able to click on them once you receive the slide deck from us later. All right, so uh, to get started, we'd just like to start by introducing ourselves to you. Uh, my name is Adam Kirsch, and I'm a shopping feed specialist. Uh, I've been doing this for a while. I actually recently celebrated my three-year anniversary here at Volusion. Uh, I manage client accounts on a number of other a, a number of shopping feed engines like Google, Amazon, Bing, and Shopping.com, to name just a few. And I'm Kavi Cardos. I'm an SEO specialist here at Volusion, and I work on search engine optimization for all kinds of clients, from sellers of lawnmower parts to beauty products, and pretty much everything in between. So let's jump right into the agenda for today's webinar. Oh, and by the way, I hope all of you listening are fans of dogs because this webinar is going to be full of them. We love dogs here at Volusion. Who doesn't? So first, uh, we'll discuss why your product pages matter to your customers and to the search engines. Next, we'll give an overview of exactly what SEO and shopping feeds are so you'll know exactly what you're getting into. We'll talk about keywords and how they factor into the way people search for products they want to buy. After that, we'll go through each aspect of a product page and how to optimize those fields for maximum search engine visibility. And finally, we'll offer some useful resources to get you on the path to selling more through SEO and shopping feeds. First, Adam will talk about why product pages matter and why it's important to pay attention to the details in order to make them the best they can be. All right, thanks, Kavi. Uh, so product pages are going to be important for many reasons. Uh, the product page is the best place to tell your customers about the products, and in many cases, this is the last page that a user is looking at before they decide to complete their purchase. So we want to make sure that all the information is conveyed in a clear and easy to understand manner. Uh, we don't want any potential buyers to be confused or put off by leaving out critical information about the product. Uh, additionally, traffic to this page is going to be of very high quality. Once someone gets as far as actually viewing the products on your page, they're obviously going to be much more likely to buy as they're already going to be very engaged. So this page is kind of the make or break part of the sale. Uh, these pages are also particularly relevant for shopping feeds as feeds bring users directly to this product page. So now that we've kind of identified why landing pages are important, let's take a step back and discuss the properties of SEO and shopping feeds so we can kind of put this all into a context. So we're gonna start with SEO. Kavi? All right, so SEO stands for Search Engine Optimization. It's basically a set of rules and strategies that are designed to help place a website in organic search results, meaning uh, the results that make up the majority of an average search results page, so not the ads. They're the uh, results that you see here on the bottom of the screen. Google and other search engines use sophisticated algorithms to decide what they show in their search results, and SEO best practices have developed alongside those algorithms as a legitimate way of convincing the search engines that your website is worthy of being displayed. So good SEO signals that your site is relevant to what's being searched for, and that the site is also a trustworthy authority within its industry. This kind of work really requires a mix of technical and creative skills, which is why I personally love working in SEO. It lets you flex a lot of different muscles at once. And one thing I want to remind you, though, this is kind of a common misconception. SEO is not about gaming or tricking the search engines into showing your site instead of a competitor's. It's about forming a partnership between your site and the search engines for everyone's mutual benefit. All right. And uh, moving along, shopping feeds are a paid model of advertising that run on a cost-per-click basis. Uh, you've probably seen images of products in your search result pages when you're, browse when you're browsing Google. These are shopping feeds ads. We have a couple examples over here on the right. Uh, so the way that these work is that an advertiser creates an account on one of these shopping engines. To name a few, we have Google, Amazon, Bing, Shopping.com, and Shopzilla. Uh, but there are a number of others to choose from as well if you have more of a niche product or audience. Uh, so after you create an account, 
Uh, these shopping engines will be crawling your site and product landing pages and index the information there. When a shopper goes to Google or Amazon and searches for terms that are related to your products, your ads have a chance of being shown. An ad will display a lot of information, including the product picture, as well as the product's name, price, and possibly shipping and tax information as well. Users have the ability to see ads from, a, from multiple different merchants, so shopping feeds are going to be used mostly for comparison shopping. So because these run on a paid model, shopping feeds are going to be a great way to bring quick traffic to your site, and because we're using product pages as the basis for pairing shoppers with your products, that traffic is going to be of very high quality. So how do SEO and shopping feeds work together? Well, as we've mentioned, shopping feeds are something you pay for, while SEO is not. Uh, SEO tends to work more slowly to change the way the search engines display your site over time, whereas shopping feeds are a good way to get more instant traffic from customers, like Adam said. Each of these marketing channels encourages the search engines to look at your site in a different way, and implementing both of them together is kind of like a double whammy for search visibility. So for SEO, when a search engine starts looking at your website to decide where it should go in the organic search results, it starts exploring the site from the top down and uh, starting with the home page and other high level pages and eventually making its way down to the nitty gritty, those product pages that make up your larger categories. Right, and shopping feeds work in a different way, directing search engines and customers' attention directly to your product pages themselves. So by utilizing both SEO and shopping feeds together, we're encouraging search engines to look at different areas of your site at the same time, which can really help with developing your marketing strategy and contribute to your site's overall success. So moving on, uh, we want to think about how are people finding you? Uh, what are keywords and how are people searching for your products? These are some of the questions that we're going to be looking at next. So we want to consider our products from your shopper's perspective. Uh, think about what someone who wants your products is going to be searching for in search engines like Google. Uh, who is your target customer? What type of language do they use? Uh, how are they interacting with your products and your site? This is where your expertise really gets a chance to shine through and direct your customers to exactly what they're looking for. Uh, maybe, for example, they're going to a fancy dog party and they need to find the perfect hat for their Yorkie. Uh, so it's, it's your job to consider how they're going to be searching for that product and optimize your site to get uh, your product's exposure. Yep, yeah, and what type of language they use is also really important. So different types of customers might be using different terms to describe what they're looking for in a product. I wanted to use an example that comes from a client I mentioned earlier. Uh, they sell parts for zero-turn radius lawnmowers, which are usually known to us outside the landscaping industry as riding mowers. On these two slides, we're going to see the different search results that pop up when we type riding mowers into Google versus ZTR mowers, that stands for zero-turn radius. So with a search on riding mowers, we see a lot of organic and paid results from Home Depot, as you can see here. But when we search for ZTR mowers, we get only a couple of paid results from Home Depot and a lot more from Wise Sales, with John Deere as the first organic search result. This is happening because Home Depot has geared their optimization efforts, both for organic and paid search, uh, towards keywords related to that term riding mowers specifically. Wise Sales is obviously focusing their product descriptions on terms like ZTR mowers, and you can see right there in John Deere's title tag that they're focused more on the term zero turn than writing as well. So basically, Wise Sales and John Deere are likely to be more successful at selling to serious landscapers with a little bit more knowledge of lawnmower lingo, whereas Home Depot is probably targeting more of a casual home lawn care kind of customer. So as Kavi examples shows, uh, slight variations in search terms can lead to hugely different results. So with that in mind, it's important to understand a few distinctions in product information. Uh, firstly, do you want to go with an informational or a descriptive approach? For merchants that's, that are selling industrial equipment or highly technical products where a product number or a SKU would be important, I suggest my clients go a little more informational because a shopper looking for those products knows exactly what they want and is looking for something very specific. Uh, a merchant that's selling apparel or jewelry, for example, might not benefit as much from, tech, from that technical product information. And uh, shoppers are likely to, more likely to use descriptive words focusing on the color, the size, or the cut, things like that. Uh, you're going to want to have a little bit of both kinds of information in your product page, 
but it's important to understand the relationship between the two. Uh, so here, consider how different the search terms would be would be for these different pictures we have down here. Uh, while all of these may show up for searches like dog hats or dog costume, uh, if someone was going to be looking for something more specific, say a uh, cowboy dog costume or puppy party hats, uh, which type of search terms would they be using? Uh, we also want to be thinking about different product variants and keep your site's own taxonomy in mind as well. Uh, one of the easiest ways to differentiate products is to include unique attributes, such as the size and color that I mentioned before. Uh, put that in your product names and descriptions to help search engines and customers differentiate between them. Okay, I have a question for you. So what's a good way to use some differentiators like that? Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's a good question. Um, I personally uh, recently had a client that sold uh, bracelets and necklaces with different sports team logos on them. Uh, so starting out, they only had uh, one product, which was called NHL Bracelet, and they had a drop-down selection box to, choo to choose which team you wanted. Uh, so after we ran the shopping feeds for them for a while, like a week or two, uh, we didn't really see that great of a return on investment. I suggested that we break, break that product out into multiple products, uh, each one having its own unique bracelet, so um, and writing the team name in the product name. So uh, NHL bracelet, very generic. Uh, we break that out and we have Chicago Blackhawks, Blackhawks NHL bracelet, uh, Boston Bruins NHL bracelet, and each one is the unique bracelet and people can see the picture of it and it worked out great. Uh, so once we did that, the increase in the traffic and the sales were pretty immediate. It was pretty cool. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to separate them out that way. Yeah, uh, uh, right. So uh, it's really cool how that worked out. Um, moving on, uh, it's also important to consider what information is most important and place that first. It's called front loading. Uh, many search engines have a character limit of what gets displayed in a search result. So even though we want to put a lot of information in there, remember that we're working with limited space in terms of what a shopper will see on that initial search page. So put the most relevant information first in that product's title and description. Okay, so next let's get into the specific aspects of product page optimization that you'll want to focus on for SEO and shopping feed success. All the fields that we're about to discuss can be found and altered in the inventory admin section of your Volusion store, so you can customize your product pages as much as you want. Whenever you upload a new product, you'll want to think about each one of these points of customization in order to make that product stand out in the search results. All right, and uh, those customization points that we're going to be talking about are the title tag, product name, the product's image or photo, the meta description, product description, photo alt text, and URL text. Now, some of these are going to be uh, more important for one discipline and not the other, and some are going to be important for both. Uh, we're going to be going in depth with each item and kind of identifying these as we go along, starting with the title tag. Now, the title tag is something that's not going to be as important for shopping feeds as it is for SEO, so Kavi, you can take over this one. Okay, so the first and possibly most important tag for SEO is the title tag. The Volusion software has a slightly different name for this. <clears throat> Excuse me, if you're in the admin area of your store, you'll see this referred to as meta tag title. So the title tag is the big blue link that you click to get to a site from the search results page. You can see the arrow pointing to it here. The information there tells search engines what that product page is about, uh, basically right off the bat. So make sure you're using really relevant keywords here and compiling them into a natural sounding phrase. Uh, Adam talked a bit about front loading earlier and that can come into play here too. So as you can see in our example here, dog hats is the first phrase that you see because it's the most important. Um, keep in mind there's also a character limit on title tags. It's actually determined by pixel width and not character or word count, but if you stick to around 70 characters, you should be safe without your title tags getting cut off in the search results. Right, and uh, you know, I said it before, but just to reiterate, the title tag is not going to be directly relevant to shopping feeds, uh, and this is just because shopping feeds are not reading this information. Uh, they're going to be looking at uh, other aspects of, of your site that we're going to be talking about later. So next we have the meta description, and again, the Volusion software refers to this tag slightly differently, so in your admin area, it's called meta tag description. It's the couple of lines of text that appear in the search results just below the title tag and URL, and there's the arrow pointing to it again. 
Uh, what's different about this tag is that the search engines don't actually read this information the way they read title tags and product descriptions. So what's written here won't affect search rankings. Uh, but you know who does read this information, of course, and that's your customers. Um, when potential customers are scanning the search results page, this little bit of text right here is really the only shot you get at grabbing their attention and influencing the click-through rate. So that means your meta descriptions should contain some really compelling marketing messaging that will cause people to click your link instead of a competitor's. So this is an ideal spot to include an enticing phrase like free shipping, like we've done here. And like the title tag, this one has a pixel width limit as well. So you want to keep meta descriptions to about 156 characters. Uh, so wait, can I, can I stop you there for a second? <laughs> what? Uh, I, I don't do SEO. What's, what's the deal with 156 characters? That's, that's pretty specific. It why is, not, yeah. Why not 150 <laughs> or, or 175? <laughs> sure. So um, that can vary slightly, but there's been a lot of testing on things like that. And we found that that's about how long a description can be before it starts getting cut off. But since that is such a specific number and hard to keep track of, um, I've included a link here to a handy tool that can help you make sure your tags are the right length. So remember, you can't click on this link now, but you'll be able to when we send you these sli the slides after the webinar is over. Um, so again, keyword placement doesn't matter so much here in the meta description because the search engines can't read that description, but keep the human click-through issue in mind and really try to make these tags pop as much as you can. Okay, so we're going to talk about what actually appears on your product pages themselves. For SEO, the most important thing about your product page is the product description. And that's the text on this page here on the right, the example under the word description. So here's another place where you want to include relevant keywords in a way that sounds really natural. Uh, the inclusion of keywords here signals to the search engines what the page is about, but it's a good rule of thumb to write like your audience is a human and not a computer. Make sure that any content you put here is really natural sounding and also that it's unique. This content should really only appear on your site and nowhere else on the web. Um, we had a question about this actually, someone asking if you separate out nearly identical products, how do you mitigate duplicate content? So if you're a reseller especially, I know it can be really tempting to just copy the manufacturer's product descriptions from their website and paste them into yours, but search engines do look down on and can even penalize duplicate content. So make sure you add your own pizzazz to those descriptions. And if it's a couple of uh, products that are really, really similar to each other, just make sure that you've used slightly different phrasing to describe the product on each page so that it's not seen as duplicate content. Uh, right. It's also going to be very important to include any, nef any information that's necessary to make a purchase here. Uh, so if you're only going to be shipping to certain areas or anything like that, it's important to mention it. Uh, otherwise, you could find yourself with an abundance of abandoned carts or unsatisfied customers that had different expectations. Yep, and uh, one other thing, make sure that you include some kind of call to action as well. So a simple phrase like buy now or get one while they last might sound kind of cheesy, but there's a lot of research that shows that that call to action really can influence buying behavior. So just a few more things you want to keep in mind about your product descriptions. First, activate your customer reviews. This is a really simple thing you can toggle on and off in your admin area, and it can make a huge difference to your customers. So recently, Adam and I both went to a conference where we learned uh, that customer reviews are trusted 12 times more than manufacturer descriptions. And in fact, if the millennial demographic is part of your customer base, this one's a real eye-opener. Half of millennials trust customer reviews more than they trust information from their own friends and family. Basically, people just want to hear the straight truth from others who have experienced that product themselves. So really, don't wait to activate the reviews on your site, and also encourage happy customers to write reviews, too. Make sure that you're using H1 tags in your product descriptions. These are kind of like titles or headings for the rest of the description, and search engines pay a lot of attention to them. If you have other important keywords that you couldn't naturally fit into your title tag, for example, the H1 is a good place to put those instead. And that H1 is just a really simple piece of HTML code, and I mean really, really simple. It's just a couple of characters that's super easy to include in your descriptions. Uh, and for shopping feeds, you want to stay away from using special characters when possible. Uh, these can be things like Greek symbols, uh, characters that have accent marks, or trademark symbols, copyright symbols, things like that. Uh, the reason that we want to um, keep those out if we can is because Google and other shopping engines might have problems reading, encoding, and displaying these symbols. 
and instead they can uh, display uh, different incorrect characters and there's also a chance of a product with these special characters to be rejected and uh, disapproved from advertising altogether. So um, what if I'm selling a product and the, the manufacturer requires me to include one of those trademark symbols every time I use the product name? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Uh, so if you do have to have these symbols in there, uh, be sure that you're not just copying and pasting them from the manufacturer's description or from another page somewhere else on the web. Uh, instead, what you can do is write in the HTML code for that character in your feed file. Uh, in a few slides, I'm going to give you a resource for something like that. Uh, but a simple Google search can yield a lot of similar sites with lists of special character HTML codes as well. Uh, and like I said, the reason that we want to use HTML here is because shopping engines are better able to find, uh, to, to read and understand these uh, these characters when they're written that way. It, it might sound complicated, but there's really no need to worry. It's actually uh, something that's very simple to implement. Um, another important rule here is to make sure that you don't mention promotion, you don't put in promotional text like free shipping in the product name or description. Uh, Google specifically has a rule against this actually. Uh, the product name and description should be all about the product and not a place to advertise any kind of special offers uh, that you, the merchant, might be running. Uh, you, can, you, put out a call, eh, you can call out any coupon code or special promotion with a graphic in your site's header or footer or on your homepage. Uh, you can probably see here in the top right gray box uh, that this product qualifies for free shipping, that little picture of the truck there. Uh, saying it here is just fine. We just don't want to put it in the product name or description. Uh, Google also gives merchants a place to put special promotions like this in AdWords. So while it is against their rules to have that stuff in the description, there is a place for it. Uh, we have a couple of people asking about H1 tags and how they get added to uh, the product description. So here in the second bullet point, you can see uh, the way that that H1 tag looks when you put it in. It's the same way that you would open or close any other HTML tag. Um, you can Google this. It's really, really easy to find out how to do it. But uh, again, you would basically just put that into your code for the product description and uh, right before the rest of your uh, text that goes there. All right, uh, moving along. Uh, product photos are also going to be paramount for shopping feeds, uh, so much so that a photo is required. Uh, if you don't have a product photo, your product is going to get rejected. It's as simple as that. Uh, a photo is a large part of your product's first impression so it's important that it's of high quality. Uh, if you have multiple photos, that will only help with conversions, uh, especially for merchants that are selling clothing or anything that can be viewed from multiple angles or comes in a variety of different colors. Yeah, I, I know if I'm looking to buy a dress or some other kind of clothing, jewelry, something like that, I really like to see the front and the back of it, lots of different angles, and maybe even uh, what it looks like on different sized models. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so if you look down at our examples here, the photo on the left is a clear, bright, and includes multiple alternative photos, while the, fo while the photo on the right is blurry and has that big watermark on it, uh, that's actually another rule for shopping feeds. So just like the product description can't contain any special advertisement for the merchant, uh, neither can the photo. Google will disapprove any image that has a watermark or store logo, so you want to be sure that if you're able to, that you take those out. Uh, additionally, the photo should be on an all-white background, so be sure to keep that in mind as well. So while we're talking about the photo, another important aspect of that product photo is the alt text. This is another tag that you can populate whenever you upload a new photo, and it has its own field in the Volusion admin area too. So the alt text optimizes an image by describing what appears in that image. Search engines aren't great at reading and deciphering images all that well yet, so right now they're using alt tags instead to find out what a picture is about. The best way to write a really great alt tag is to pretend you're describing the photo to a friend who's vision impaired. It can be the same as the product name or a title tag as long as it's accurately descriptive. So for example, on the left here, red hat with bow and lace for dogs is a pretty good description of what's being sold with this photo, whereas on the right, hat one doesn't really say much about that photo at all. So next we have the product's URL text. This is the actual web address of the product that you're selling, and it can be altered in the admin area of your product page too. So in our example down here, we've changed the text from the Volusion standard product-p uh, to straw boater dog hat-p. 
So the P goes in there automatically. That just indicates that it's a product page. Don't make these too long, but do make sure that you're stating what the product is, like a hat, and you're using some descriptor like straw to set it apart from other products. It's also uh, best practice not to capitalize any words in a URL, and you don't need to add in those underscores or dashes. The Volusion software will do that for you. And uh, it, it, it might sound a little advanced, but there are tracking snippets that you can add at the end of your URLs. Uh, this is something that we do for all of our shopping feed clients. So, and we do this so that we can better track visits and transactions that are coming from paid traffic, both in Google Analytics as well as your store dashboard. Uh, we've included a few links here, one from Volusion and one from Google, that will help you set this up if you're interested. Uh, when we send out this slide deck, you can click on those links and, and check them out for yourself if you'd like to. And right here we have the arrow pointing to that link that Copy was talking about before. All right, so next up is the product name. Uh, now, one thing I didn't mention earlier is that shopping feeds work a little differently from a text ad campaign that we create in AdWords. Uh, so with text ads, we're able to give Google a list of key words and phrases that we'd like to have our products associated with. Uh, shopping feeds are not key keyword based like that. Uh, they don't use keywords in the same way. Instead, uh, search engine a search engine will take the information on your product page, including your product name and description, and use that to pair products with, your, with search terms. So because of that, the product name is absolutely critical to shopping feed success. We want to use natural keywords where possible and include appropriate nouns. Uh, you know, I have an example of, an, of a client who sold jewelry. Uh, each necklace and bracelet and earring set uh, was named after a woman's name. So you'd have something like a really nice looking necklace with a pink pendant, and it was called the Chelsea. Uh, or a bracelet with turquoise gems called the Alyssa, for example, things like that. Uh, the product name didn't even include the words necklace or bracelet. So uh, it could be a little confusing to Google. Now, if you are a visitor to that site, you have the benefit of being able to look at the picture and deduce what the product is, or you can see that you're in a necklace or a bracelet category on the website but Google isn't going to understand exactly what that product is. And so as a result, it's going to match you with some pretty strange or irrelevant search terms. We wanna make sure that the product title conveys exactly what the product is and can stand on its own to describe the product. Uh, and as, we're talking, uh, as we were talking about earlier, if you're selling a product that has a technical, that is, that has a technical aspect or is in any other way specific, consider including that part number. Yep, and uh, going back to that lawnmower example I used earlier, that client knew a lot of customers would be buying lawnmower parts by basically looking through their owner's manual and then searching for that specific part number that they needed. So they included those numbers in their product names too. Right, okay. Uh, so because the product name is so important for shopping feeds, there's some rules to follow. Uh, these rules are going to be strictly enforced and may vary depending on which shopping engine you're using, but as Google is far and away the most popular, I'm going to discuss rules for them. Uh, as, we mentioned, er, as we mentioned earlier, you want to avoid using special characters if possible. If you can't get around it, you can look up the HTML coding for them. I've included a link here that I personally use. It's from the University of Texas Library. Uh, it's not completely exhaustive, but it covers just about everything that I've seen in my time working with shopping feeds and has been a pretty valuable source for me. Um, also, do not use all capital letters or excessive punctuation in your, in your product names. Uh, Google will penalize your ads because this is considered to be kind of spammy. Uh, you also want to make sure that you're using proper spelling and grammar. Now, there is going to be a little bit of leeway with this because some brand names are spelled incorrectly on purpose. So Google might not necessarily reject everything that's spelled wrong, but if you have several errors in there, don't be surprised if your products or your ads get disapproved. And, and really, if Google were to approve everything, these errors would likely lead to fewer click-throughs and possibly a feeling of distrust with your shopper. Uh, you know, we have an example down here at the bottom. Luckily, this is not from a Volusion, a Volusion merchant. We had to create this on our own. But um, you know, there's misspellings in there. 
all those special characters. It's advertising free shipping. Um, you know, I'm personally going to be thinking twice before I purchase something from a site that looks like this, just because uh, it doesn't look as professional as something that I would like to buy from. Yeah, it seems a little harder to trust, and uh, you know, that's not someone you want to give your money to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, finally, we have the meta keywords tag or meta meta tag keywords uh, if you're looking in the Volution software. So this is an interesting one. Search engines like Google used to place a ton of emphasis on the meta keywords tag. Back in the old days of SEO, this tag was used similarly to the title tag, just to describe to the search engines what each page is about. But people started really abusing that keywords tag like crazy, stuffing in tons of keywords and creating really spammy content. So now search engines don't use or look at or even really like this tag at all. It's not important for SEO or for shopping feeds. Uh, keeping your keywords in mind is really important for creating good product descriptions and tags, but please don't waste your time actually inputting them into your admin area. Not only will this not help you, it might actually hurt you. So it's possible to look at the source code for any web page on the internet, and if your competitors looked at your page's source code and saw a list of keywords there, then they would know what terms you're optimizing your site for and could try to hijack you by optimizing their site for the same terms. Obviously, you don't want to give your competitors any hints, so just leave this tag alone. All right, so that was a lot of information, and you're probably what's wondering. Well, you're probably wondering what's most important for each discipline. So we have kind of a list here. We're just going to kind of go over what we think is most important. Yep, just some things to focus on uh, for SEO and feeds. So for SEO, I would say the most important tag to fill out is the title tag. It's just like it sounds. It's a title for the whole web page, and search engines treat it with exactly that much importance. Um, we did have someone ask if the title tag is for the product or the entire site. Every page on your website has a title tag that you can enter, so you'll want to write a different one. Uh, having unique title tags for each page is really important as well. Your product description is next, and again, like I said, you want to use natural sounding, keyword rich content. That's really vital for search engine visibility and also for customer conversion. And finally, even though it doesn't get read by the search engines, the meta description is also really important. Like I said before, this is your best shot at luring a customer from the search results page to your website. So pull out your best marketing language here. Right. And for shopping feeds, I'd say that the most important fields are going to be the product name and the description. Uh, as I said before, this is because shopping engines use this information most when they're deciding which search terms are relevant to the products that you are selling. And we'll be showing your ads based on how descriptive this information is. Uh, also important is the product image. Uh, shopping engines will not accept any product that does not have a photo, so it's obviously going to be very important. You want to make sure that you're submitting a high-quality, clear picture of the product on an all-white background if possible. Uh, also, shopping engines are all about comparison shopping, so it's required to have the product price and shipping and tax information included in your feed file, as this will be displayed with your shopping feed ad. And, and finally, keep all your promotional text in the correct places. You can put this uh, anywhere else on your site, on your homepage, a header or a footer, and you can also put these uh, within the shopping feed, uh, within shopping feeds themselves using AdWords. We don't want to put that in the product title or description as they'll get disapproved. So we've gone over a lot of things today. There's plenty of other information out there. Uh, so we've put together a short list of some free resources and tools that you can use if you get stuck or if you're out of ideas on how to optimize. So first off, there are a lot of tools within AdWords that you can use like the Keyword Planner. Uh, this tool offers suggestions of words and phrases that Google thinks is uh, relevant to your site. Uh, you can get an idea of what people are searching for and what's popular. Uh, this can give you plenty of ideas on how to optimize your pages if you're stuck. And the SEO team here at Volusion uses that keyword tool all the time too. Um, we write content for our clients and use that a lot to decide what keywords we should use. That's a really good one. You can also use Google Trends, which is basically a website where you can type in a keyword and see how its popularity has changed in search over time. Maybe your products have a lot of seasonality, they sell better in the summer or something like that. This is where you can find out exactly where those seasons start and end to. And also, anytime you do a Google search, if you scroll to the bottom of the search results page, you'll see Google's suggested search terms that are related to whatever you typed in. This is a great way to brainstorm new keywords that you might not have thought of on your own. Uh, next, Google Analytics is a tool that's absolutely necessary for anyone with an e-commerce website. 
that helps you keep track of traffic to your site, where that traffic's coming from, what products and landing pages are most successful, all kinds of stuff. Plus it's free, so you should really set up an analytics account right away if you haven't already. Google and Bing Webmaster Tools are also free services that can point out any errors you might have your, on your site and uh, help show you what people are searching for in order to land on your page. Webmaster Tools goes hand in hand with analytics, so go ahead and set those up at the same time. Uh, and Volusion has a treasure trove of resources that go over the finer points of product page optimization, as well as, as SEO and shopping feeds in general. Uh, we've included two links here to past blog posts and webinars, but you can use the search function on the blog to find articles on a variety of topics about your Volusion store, whether related to the topics in this webinar or not. Uh, I've actually personally written a few things on the blog, so I can vouch for their information. They're all awesome. And, and uh, Kavi, you've done some stuff on previous webinars and stuff too, right? Yep. Yeah. All right. So uh, now we're going to be start, re we're ready to start taking some questions. We're going to take a short break and just kind of go over some of the questions that we've got coming in here. And we'll be back in just a little bit to start answering them. Uh, anything that we don't get to uh, while we're, while we're uh, working on a time frame here, uh, we'll be sure to follow up in a blog post in the next couple of weeks. So be on the lookout for that. All right, we're back to answer some of your questions that you've been typing in. Thank you for those. Um, we had a bunch of questions about H1s, and I know that that can be uh, somewhat confusing because, like I said, it is a piece of HTML that you have to put into your product description. But like I said, it's really, really easy to do. Um, there's no character limit for the H1 tag, so you can have as many characters there as you want. Just make sure that you're making it you know, concise, using it the same way that you would uh, a title for your product, for example. Um, it's... It's, uh, it can have the name of the product in there. Um, if It might also be useful to add in a couple more keywords that you weren't maybe able to fit into your title tag or your product description. And uh, that's just to sort of pull in more keywords, help people search uh, for even, even more words than you've already included. Um, Colby asked also, does it have to be an H1 or will H3 work as well? So that's a good question. Um, H1s, H2s, H3s, there's a whole hierarchy to the way that those tags work. And an H1 is something that uh, the search engines go to first. That's why it's number one. Um, so you can use H2s, H3s if you want, but keep in mind that they won't be read as quickly. They won't take as much importance as that H1 tag. And uh, we're going to be writing, I think, a blog post about H1 tags as well, since there have been so many questions about it. Um, there's obviously a lot of interest here, so we'll just go ahead and follow up with that in a blog post as well. All right. Uh, Denise asked, what is taxonomy? Uh, this is just uh, kind of how your uh, site uh, is organized and how everything uh how everything uh, flows within your site. So, you know, different product categories. Um, Kavi, is there anything else that you can add to this? It's just... Um, it's just, yeah, again, yeah. it's just sort of the, the architecture of your site. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so, you know, big categories with smaller subcategories in there, ideally, and then, you know, maybe even more subcategories after that, and then finally just getting down to your products. So it's just that format of how everything uh, is laid out. Yep, and just basically the term we use to describe the organization of the site. Right. Um, uh, also, Cheryl was asking where exactly are we entering this information, so that's a really important thing to know, obviously. Um, like I said, when you're in the back end of your Volusion store, if you go to one of your products um, and scroll to the bottom of that page, there's a place where you can enter in all of these tags. So every product page has its own uh, set of fields, title, tag, description, all of that stuff. And um, it's easy to find, like I said, if you just scroll to the bottom of each of your product pages, you can enter different information for each one. So each product can really be customized uh, individually as much as you want. Right. And uh, Eamon asked, uh, can you go over how to submit your product for shopping feeds? Uh, there's a couple different ways that we can go about it. Um, if you're searching on the Volusion blog, there's, um, there's a, a good resource there that goes over how to submit it uh, via XML. Um, there's, a there's a Volusion integration with Google Shopping that can uh, walk you through the steps to set that up. Uh, someone on our support team can also um, be sure to help you with that. Um, we also have a uh, partnered software called GoDataFeed that um, we use for uh, anyone that purchases the sh our shopping feed service. Um, and this is um, kind of a, uh, a software that lets you import your information using uh, your store's API. 
and then uh, you can uh, manage your your products there using a couple custom SQL rules there. Uh, the interface in GoData Feed makes it really simple to use. Uh, you can also request a, a demo for them to help you set that up. Um, they have a, a support line that, that can obviously help you out as well, and, and they're great people. Really like them a lot. So, Adam, we also had a couple of questions about photos, um, whether they can be on a black background, a gray background, and what the, the image dimension should be. Um, Roxanne asked if there is an impact for SEO if your photos have a black background, and that won't affect your SEO at all, but Adam can talk about how it might affect your shopping feeds. Uh, yeah, so shopping feeds do, uh, they, they want to have that photo be on a white background. Um, you know, it's, it's the type of thing where, um, you know, you might not get penalized for it immediately there, you know, I've seen some clients get away with having one or two that are not, uh, on a white background, but, um, you know, just it's, uh, it, it's going to be a best practice to have it on, on a white background. So if you're able to, uh, change that using some kind of photo editing software, uh, I would highly recommend that. Um, we also had uh, somebody ask about image dimensions. I believe that was a Jan. Um, you know, I uh, if if we're looking at the Volusion backend, I use the dash two or the dash two T photo. Those are the larger photos um, to be submitting, and that's uh, just because um, you know we want to make sure that we're submitting uh, a good sized photo. Um, different shopping engines will have. Uh, different image requirements. I know that Amazon is uh, pretty particular in their pixel width, uh, but this is something that you can uh, look up with any shopping engine that you're going to be working on and working with. Yeah, and about that white background too, I, I mean, just as someone who shops online, I know that if I was looking at uh, shopping feeds results and saw that they were all on a white background, but then there's one that has a black background, I would probably think that that site maybe doesn't know what they're doing quite as much. Um, they're not following the rules. So I think I'd be less likely to click on that one uh, just because, you know, like I said, it looks like they're not really adhering to the conventions quite as much. Um, but if your images are PNGs, especially instead of JPEGs or something like that, it's it, they should have a transparent background and it should be pretty easy to change from a, a black background to a white one. Mm -hmm. uh, Isabel asked, what are the costs per click in Google? Uh, this is something that is going to vary based on uh, the industry that you're in and uh, the uh, competitiveness of, of what you're selling. Um, you know, we can't really give any kind of a, a firm number. Um, and and uh, Google works on an auction-based system, so it's really all about just kind of supply and demand. Uh, you know, if your products have a kind of uh, seasonality to them and we're getting close to the time when those products are going to be popular, uh, you know, any other, all the other merchants out there that are selling these products are probably going to be increasing their bids and uh, likely the, the cost per those clicks are going to be uh, rising for uh, across the board for all other merchants that are selling those products. It's, it's a dynamic system that uh, you know, changes over time. Uh, in AdWords though, um, Google gives you a, a, a stat called a benchmark max CPC. And what this is is that uh, Google kind of uh, aggregates and uh, uh, averages all bids on products that uh, merchants are uh, selling that are similar to yours, that Google has deemed to be selling uh, products that are similar to yours, and kind of gives um, kind of a, a recommendation. Uh, I always take this with a little bit of a grain of salt, though, because uh, it is something that uh, Google's doing kind of automatically. There's no real transparency to see uh, exactly what they're saying is relevant to you. But, you know, it's uh, it's kind of a good idea to get, um, you know, just kind of look at what kind of a ballpark would be. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, Christy and George had a couple of sort of general SEO questions, so I'll answer those. Christy asked, for a new site, what's a reasonable amount of time to expect results from SEO? Uh, that really depends on what you're selling, what kind of industry you're in. But um, like I said at the beginning of the webinar, SEO is a long-term process. It can move somewhat slowly, um, and shopping feeds, like we said, is a bit more instant way to get traffic. Uh, we like to say that you know somewhere between three and six months is when you might start to see uh, some impacts in organic search results from the from your SEO efforts. But again, that's not a hard and fast rule. It really does depend on uh, the shape, what kind of shape your site is in in general, what you're selling. 
um, how competitive the space is that you're selling in. So if you're selling jewelry, for example, that's a really, really competitive market and it can take longer uh, for your, your search rankings to be impacted. The number one thing that we like to tell people is that you shouldn't be concentrating on your search rankings. So don't worry about whether or not you come up first in search results. Um, install that Google Analytics, like I said before, and keep track of what's happening to your traffic and your revenue. As long as those numbers are going up, then you're in good shape and you shouldn't be worried too much about who's showing up ahead of you in the search results. And uh, George also said, looking at my traffic, it appears that the search engines are looking at my site before I go live. Is this true and why did they do it? So that probably is true. Um, if you're setting up a site on Volusion and it hasn't gone live yet, you're still on that server trust site, then it can still be indexed. Um, any information that's on your site, as long as it appears on the web, can be indexed. Search engines will read it. So uh, that is definitely possible. And um, if, like I said, if it's live on the server trust site, then yes, uh, the search engines can see it. Uh, just you know, make sure that once your site actually goes live, you may see a slight change in traffic if you're keeping track of that. Just make sure that, um, that it's totally up to date and all in shape and stuff by the time you are ready to launch. Uh, Ronald asked, he has watermarks on his website photos, but not on product photos. And he's asking if that's okay. Um, so as long as the photo that you're going to be submitting to a shopping engine does not have the watermark on it, you should be okay. Uh, I've had uh, a client in the past where, uh, we were able to, to do that, uh, because they wanted to keep the watermark on the, the photo that was on their product page in order to, uh, you know, kind of protect their branding, but they had, uh, they had different, um, they had a different file of each image that didn't have that watermark on it. And we were able to submit that image and, and that worked fine because that was going to be uh, the image that Google and, and Amazon and these other shopping engines was actually showing. And then when they, uh, and then when a shopper clicked onto that ad to be brought to their site, the product page had the, the watermark on, on the image there. So if you do it that way, it should be okay. Uh, it has been a while since I since I did since we did that with uh, that client, and and they're no longer a client of mine. Uh, so you know uh, the the it, it may have changed since then. Uh, Google's kind of changing their rules uh, often. So um, you know I, I know that that's how it was. Uh, this was probably about uh, I want to say it was less than a year ago. Uh, so. You know, uh, it, it worked out then. It might still work now. I say that it's worth a shot to try that. Okay, uh, a couple of quick questions about some tags. Vladimir asks, can we put price in the title tag? You can. Um, it's not going to hurt you to do that if you want to, but keep in mind that your prices can change over time. If something goes on sale or uh, if you need to raise prices for any reason, then you would need to go in there and change the price in the title tag. So it's probably easier if you don't. Um, just leave your price, you know, in the in the product description and on your product page. I know for feeds you have to include it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, like I said, you can include it in the title tag if you really want to, but it's the title tag is sort of permanent. Once you change it, that's the way that it's going to be until you go in and change it again. So I would probably avoid doing that just because it makes it easier for you. Uh, and Sean asked, how do you do shopping feeds uh, with apparel? Uh, this is something that we kind of talked a little bit about uh, throughout the presentation. I believe that there actually is a blog post on Volusion that talks about this specifically, uh, just how to how to uh, customize it for apparel. Um, because we're going to be working with uh, a bunch of different child products here, um, and, and a child product is going to uh, share a web page with the parent product, um, you know, that's, that's going to change a couple things that we're doing here. Uh, we want to make sure that the images that we're submitting for the child products uh, are uh, actually going to be the same image from the parent product. And, uh, and the link would also be the same. Uh, it's a little uh, complicated to kind of go over right here. Uh, I'll probably, I'll, I'll be checking and making sure that there is a, a post that goes over this. Uh, and if not, I'll be going over some information in a blog uh, later on. Okay, uh, Joe asked on alt text, what's the optimal number of characters? Um, this isn't something that has a character limit, like the title tag or the, or the description tag. Um, you can really put as many characters as you want into a photo alt text, it's not going to hurt you. 
But um, just like any other tag, just like an H1 or really anything else you write on your site, try to keep it concise. Um, you don't want to be, you know, running away with these gigantic tags that are difficult to read. So um, just use the keywords that you need and, and don't get crazy with them. And then uh, there's a couple of questions about meta keywords. Sarah asks, should we delete the meta keywords if we've already put them in? Uh, you, you're not going to get penalized for having keywords on your site. So the search engines won't, uh, won't get you in trouble for that. But like I said, it can sort of give your competitors a hint as to uh, what words you're optimizing for. So if you're on the, the, the product page already, you might as well just go ahead and take them out. Uh, and Andrew asks, uh, do you recommend I use the type of product and the product name, like popcorn, rather than just the flavor? Um, you know, that's that's something that I would always say is is a good idea. Yeah, you want to put, definitely. yeah, you want to put as much information of in, in there to to describe the product as you can. Yeah, um, definitely include it. Yeah, and, and <laughs> that'll help your SEO as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It describes the product, so make sure that it's there. Yeah, just having, um, you know, if, if, if for example your product name is uh, some cute name for popcorn, then yeah, just make, make sure that it doesn't just say cheddar brand name. Make sure that it also has the word popcorn in there because that's how search engines will know what the product is. Uh, right. And we have uh, another question here asking, uh, which is best shopping feeds or Google AdWords? I think you mean a PPC text ad campaign. Um, it's, it's going to be different. Uh, shopping feeds and, and uh, PPC uh, are both really great resources to bring fast traffic to your site. Uh, but they they work a little differently, and uh, they're they both have their own strengths. Uh, PPC is uh, really good for getting uh, getting your brand name out there and getting some kind of recognition that way. Um, you know, because with PPC and text ads, we're able to uh, tell Google what search terms we want to be showing up for. Uh, you can really cast a wider net with uh, with potential search terms, uh, and you can kind of you know, gear out um, what you want, uh, how you want people to be brought to your site. Um, shopping feeds uh, are going to be product based and uh, very, uh, very particular using your product information, your title and your description. So, um, you know, we're not able to tell Google what we want uh, to, ser to show up for. Um, so it's going to be different. Um, just because of the way that shopping feeds work, um, you know, we'll see, we normally see across accounts that, uh, they might have a, a lower cost per click, but fewer impressions as well, because, uh, you know, with, with PPC, you're able to kind of target a wider audience. So, you know, I, I definitely say that they, they work differently. Both are great. Uh, if you're able to run both, uh, and, um, and you know, spend spend your money that way. You'll uh, just only increase the amount of real estate that you get on on a search engine result page, which is great. Yep. Um, okay. Let's see. Kelly says, does it matter if you have a lot of product names repeating certain words? Uh, nope. That's fine. Just make sure that your product names are really descriptive. Um, so if you know, we had an example about popcorn earlier. If you sell a ton of different kinds of popcorn, totally fine to use the word popcorn in all of your product uh, names, and you you should be doing that since. That's what the product is. Um, so it's okay to repeat that word over and over again. Just make sure that your names are really descriptive and that they're different from each other. So uh, as long as you don't have a bunch of different product names that are exactly the same, you should be fine. You know, blue shirt, red shirt, green shirt, that kind of thing. That's okay. Um, just as long as it's, as it's uh, unique and descriptive. Um, let's see. Christina also said, is there a certain font that should be used when creating a description for your product so the search engines read it better? Nope. Search engines don't care about fonts at all. They can't even read fonts. Um, so don't worry about that. Just, you know, make sure that whatever font you're using goes along with the design of your site and, uh, that it's attractive and easy to read. Uh, all right. We have just a few minutes left here. Uh, Jim asked, are PNGs better than JPEGs? Uh, this doesn't matter. Uh, it's uh, it's really just about the the quality of the photo. So uh, you know if you only have it in one uh, file type, uh, just as long as it's a good looking photo, that should be fine. Uh, Mark says we sell electronic parts where most people search for both a manufacturer name and the part number. Should I put the title tag uh, followed by uh, with manufacturer followed by the part number or vice versa? Um, you know I would say that uh, you know, as long as you're working within that character limit, um, I, I don't think that it would matter as much. I'd probably no. put the brand name first. Uh, yeah, I would, I would just put because the name that probably first. would have 
uh, more more search volume right. for people looking for the brand name. Yeah, and if they're both in there, um, that front loading issue with title tags isn't so huge. Um, if as long as they're both there, then then both the number and the name will be read. Um, so deciding which one to put first isn't a huge deal. Just uh, you know, if, if that's if part numbers are something that you know people are definitely searching for, then do include them, um, and it shouldn't matter too much where they go. Uh, Dana says, uh, what is the best way to use shopping feeds for child products? Uh, this is something that I touched on a little bit earlier when we were talking about apparel. Uh, I'll be writing a blog that kind of uh, goes over some of that because it can get a little complicated and, and a little in-depth and we're a little strapped for time here. Um, let's see. Uh, JP says, do you have any resources to learn more about shopping feeds and how to optimize campaigns? Uh, that's something else that we can address in, in a blog as well. Uh, you know, we can give out a, a list of, of different resources. Uh, the Google help is a great one. Uh, you can, you know, if you're just typing in, uh, uh, Google shopping policies, that'll take you to a Google help article that will really, uh, help you, uh, with, with some of their rules. Yep, and Volusion, like we said before, has a ton of resources for this too. It's all over our blog, all over the webinars page, um, so you can learn really as much as you want. Our uh, our support uh, knowledge base also has a ton of articles on how to set up those things for yourself. And of course, you can always uh, get in touch with our marketing team too if you want help setting up your campaigns. Um, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up, so thanks so much for entering all those questions and for watching today. And uh, Adam, anything else you want to close up with? Uh, no, I think that's it. Uh, thanks, guys. It has been great. Yep. Happy selling. <laughs>